Minister Reddy, you were speaking earlier on about the challenges that you faced in, in, an, in the context of a newly formed state and trying to respond to the pandemic. Just talk to me then about how do we future-proof health systems against those kind of pandemics that you've spoken about from a governance perspective as well? As I said earlier, governments would have to be focusing on two things. One is preventive, one is preventive care and the other is curative care. And looking at this from the, uh, from the lens of uh, uh, how to improve this uh, health care, one would have to be talking about availability, accessibility of health care, and also affordability of health care. All these three would have to be moving in line. In order to do that, uh, from my state's perspective as to how we have, how, like, how we have been uh, uh, wanting to move forward is, we've taken every uh, 2,000 people, uh, every pop population with, uh, every village with 2,000 population as a unit, and we're coming up with uh, village clinics. Okay. And then uh, we're taking up every uh, 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 30,000 population as a unit, as a, a unit and uh, uh, classifying it as Mandal, and where we're coming up with uh, two PHCs, uh, primary health centers. These primary health centers would have uh, 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 four doctors, two of the doctors uh, uh, present in each of the PHC center, and they would be given uh, an ambulance, 104, and each of this doctor would be given their designated villages. So five villages or four villages, depending on the mandal size, to each of these doctors. And these doctors, every alternate day, would hop onto the ambulance and visit the village. And they would become the family doctor for that village. Very soon, the doctors, because they've been de designated only those four villages, so they would start to identify people by names. And they would use this village clinic as a hub. This village clinic primarily would be having an A&M, uh, nursing graduate, uh, mid-level health practitioner, and ASHA workers that we spoke about also reporting there. So that would take care of the, the preventive part. Now comes the curative part. The curative part would be dealing with uh, uh, the community, with uh, uh, district hospitals, the teaching hospitals the area, hosp area hospitals and the teaching hospitals are going to play a very critical role there. So there we're coming up with uh, uh, every parliament taken as a unit uh, we've, uh, uh, in order to ensure that there is equitable distribution of uh, teaching hospitals. Because only when, you have, when you, only when you establish teaching hospitals, you have postgraduate students actually coming up there. And only when you have postgraduate students doing their course there, and these uh, teaching hospitals are connected to a, a hospital, a teaching hospital as well. So teaching college and teaching hospital together would become the tertiary care that, we're, that we are looking for. Okay. We're going to come back to that issue a little bit later on if we've got time. Catherine, when we're speaking about migration, is it correct to quantify it as a crisis, one? And two, what possibilities are there for planning um, scenarios where even if there is a crisis, mm -hmm. there's resilience in healthcare services, and there's also a form of adequate care. Well, yes, it's absolutely a crisis. I mean, the estimates are that 36 million children right now are in migration sort of crossing borders, and another 20 million are moving inside countries, so IDPs. And that's a horrible uh, problem for children around the world because it's so unstable for them, right? They're moving from one place to another. We don't have good data on whether there is sufficient health care in these migration situations, but we know it's, there's typically not, right? It's very hard, and we um, encourage countries that, that are receiving these migrants to in, incorporate these people into their own health systems, but that's 
I, I can't say that that's happening uh, very much, and so it's very difficult. You could imagine things like routine immunizations, things that matter to children, nutrition, uh, maternal care. All of those things are so disrupted when you're in a situation of migration, as, as you can imagine. Um, as the minister said, really what you need is good primary health care. That's the single most important thing. And trying to build that up in countries and in, con in situations where migrants are, are living is really the most important thing. Um, but we're living in a world of uh, very difficult circumstances and very fragile systems that really need to be built up, these health care systems, because as we saw with COVID, I mean, even a country like the United States, Western countries are pushed to the brink with something like COVID. So imagine countries that don't have sufficient health care, right, that don't, can't provide that for their people. So we see this as an opportunity now to go in and really try to build up these systems, and that requires good governance, which you're seeing from the minister, but it also requires sustainable um, resources, which is always the challenging piece. Mm -hmm. If we keep using this word resilience when we're taking a look forward at the future, what would you say, how are we going to build resilience so that when the next pandemic comes along, because this won't be our last one, we, we've taken the lessons that we've learned around that and used them for that? Well, I, th I think there are obvious places where, for example, we we almost had just in time as religion when it comes to many countries, when it came to protective equipment, that's easy to, to do something about. Uh, so, and, but it requires a little funding to get higher inventories of protective equipment. Um, there is lots to be said about preparing for how to uh, actually build medicines, how to do medicines in different uh, countries and different continents and be able to roll that out at scale quickly and to do it quickly it requires preparation to be able to do it. I would argue that, that uh, good sanctionable trade agreements such that we don't end up in immediately losing resources on a world scale just yes, because one country does this or that uh, are the types of measures that we could take longer term and more difficult but it would build a greater resilience. We have a war call right now in, in many, many countries that says autonomy and we should be very autonomous. Uh, all of that is good to, up to some level but it creates an enormous complexity of, of duplication and cost if we are to do it at each country. So I would start with the first uh, aspect of saying let's try to make global agreements in such a way that they will actually hold even in a period of crisis. Um, all of this, very interesting. In a minute, Jay, um, how do we plan to mitigate risks like supply challenges, wars uh, and access in the future? In a minute. Yes. <laughs> so um, I think the, that early uh, awareness and early thinking is, is absolutely critical. Um, you know, in the case of the industry, early planning for access so that when you're designing a product, when you're thinking which products should be part of the uh, research and development pipeline, uh, already needs uh, uh, supply, uh, uh, needs need to be taking account of, of supply issues, affordability issues, and how will a particular product be used in a primary or tertiary care system. Um, I think at the end of it, you definitely need to see a closer collaboration between uh, industry, public partners, and, and non-profit organizations, getting the patient voice uh, uh, early on on board in order to make sure that the right products are being developed, the right uh, access plannings are being there. And I think the last thing is, um, you know, the efforts of an innovator, if, if done wrongly or if done rightly, may have a huge impact on, uh, on the downstream inequity issues. So um, you end up putting more pressure on a health system that is already uh, stressed if you don't uh, think about how to relieve that stress up and early. In. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. I'm going to open up the floor for questions now, and I'd like to begin with Kezavino Aram. Please let us know also if you would like to ask a question, you can raise your hand and let us know if there's a specific speaker that you would like to direct the question to. Thank you very much. It's very encouraging to hear uh, all of you. I think uh, two things, and then I'll come to the question. First is I think the pandemic has shown us fundamentally if health is not prioritized, everything can come to a stand down. So Chief Minister Reddy, it's so encouraging to hear you. To you, my question would be that uh, strengthening of the primary health care system requires a lot of effort. We know of the doctor population ratio. We know that we don't have enough doctors. but 
The pandemic has also shown us imagining new partnership, the religious communities and their assets, for example. So that's the question to you. And the second question, of course, uh, is, to, is to companies like AstraZeneca, which have made such a huge difference uh, in the transfer of not only intellectual rights and, and, and products and vaccines. India is a beneficiary. India is also a contributor. Is how do we keep children as priority? I'm not asking uh, <laughs> colleagues from UNICEF, but I'm asking you. I come from a country where 44% of the population are below 18. They have been the invisible face of the pandemic to quote UNICEF. They will need 24 months, if not more, of investment to just come out of this crisis. How can we put, uh, and to you as well, how can we put children back on the roadmap? Um, they are not our priority at the moment. And you were speaking of resilience. One of the things that we say in public health, I head a Gandhian organization in India. We say it's mental health. When we speak of mental health and resilience, we say it's a connection between internal assets that a child has and external resources that a society provides. The pandemic Beautiful. really has shown us that that link has to be established. So to people who can make a difference for children from outside, UNICEF keeps advocating that we have missed many opportunities to do that. And to you, Chief Nisaredi, it's so wonderful to hear you speak um, about the healthcare system, but it will require persistence. Already this year, the central budget in India has a shrunken health budget. Mm. So how do we keep that going? Thank you. Thank you. Should you the minister start? <laughs> It was a very lengthy question. <laughs> Put forth a lot of them. But uh, as she rightly said, uh, we have constraint on the funds. But yes, this is something that we need to deal with it. And uh, in spite of our uh, uh, difficulties, we're pushing through with it. And uh, uh, we've uh, uh, allocated a three year window where we're wanting to mobilize. Uh, $2 billion, 16,000 crores into this whole setup. And uh, uh, we, do, we, are head, we are heading in the right direction and we will do it. And as far as the doctors are concerned, as you, I mean, as you have just spoken, we, we do understand that this is a predicament that we need to deal with it. And that's exactly why we are trying to open up more medical colleges. We're coming up, the state had 11 uh, uh, teaching colleges Medical, medical colleges till we had uh, till my till our regime had come in. Now we are actually opening up 16 medical colleges, so covering uh, uh, every taking every uh, parliament as a unit, so that there is uniformity in distribution, and uh, a teaching hospital and uh, 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 and a medical college together would provide for postgraduate students to come in and provide for the health care. So. Thank you. Let me add a perspective, I think, on primary health care. I've spent a lot of time in India, and I'm quite impressed with the way that, that India is beginning to use digital in, in a way to, to enhance primary health care, uh, especially when you come out into rural areas, like in many countries. Uh, the ability to connect to someone and who's an intelligent person, but also, over time, artificial intelligence actually opens up tremendous uh, amount of low-cost healthcare opportunities, uh, wow. which I think we should do much more of. Uh, yeah. On your question to children, I think the real world there is prevention. Uh, the, the real uh, thing that we can do in healthcare systems and possibly companies, my company is involved in, in, uh, in some countries with this, is to uh, enhance good lifestyle development, uh, be able to make uh, kids leave, live a healthy life, but also to be part of that. That's very little cost. It, it's amazing, I think, that we have this 97-3, and the three here is for, for early detection and prevention among children. If we double that, that would be an enormous effort with children and at very little cost compared to treating them when they have already become ill. So I think the real world there is prevention with children.
Well, if I can add a perspective there, um, I think that it is uh, one of the reasons why uh, children are not prioritised by um, the innovative cycle is the regulatory system and in terms of clinical studies um, is, is daunting for a lot of different um, innovators to get into. And often the, the market size is relatively small. And when you think about access, you definitely need to think about how, is, um, how, are, how are kids actually being cared for and uh, the role of the caregiver and the role of the primary health system. Um, you know, as long as we keep talking about the fact that health systems are fragile, I think that you end up seeing that lots of innovators, you know, wait and wait for the problems to be solved before they innovate. The research and development pipeline, the, uh, the level of access uh, for children is not going to change unless we all consciously make an effort to put children uh, front and centre in the response. And there are a lot of new platforms that are being developed. Uh, there's a platform called GAPF looking at priority products for children, how to design differently, what does access mean, looking at supply chain improvements. But it really must, must include uh, the primary health care system, the preventative element of it, treatment, curative, and the role of the caregiver. I think that, is, um, that, is, that has to be in, in the system itself. Okay. I'm going to open up the floor for more questions. I can see a hand here and a hand behind me if we can just get mics to so the questions can be asked. The lady over there had her hand up first. Uh, thank you so much, dear speakers. Should I stand? Yes, you can. It's up to you. Thank you so much, dear speakers. I'm Nupur Kohli. I'm a global shaper from the Amsterdam hub. We are young people between the age of 18 and 30 from the World Economic Forum. I also work for the largest healthcare insurance company in the Netherlands. So my question to you is, looking at healthcare resilience, what do you think is the role of healthcare insurance in many countries where it's actually not available? And I feel... It's a primary human right to also have health care insurance in many countries. Is there a specific person that you'd like to answer the question or is it open to the floor? Um, I would like uh, uh, Mr. Johansson and also uh, their chief minister to answer okay. those questions. How Thank you. you would add. Thank you. All right, can, can we okay, I, I think uh, you're happy to. I, I think traveling around the world like we are we we have people on the ground in more than 100 countries and we are selling drugs into 200 countries um, it's it's very good to see the development in many countries india china etc where reasonable healthcare programs are being put in place and mainly as a government uh, effort uh, how to best combine those uh, with between private and, and government efforts, I think, is up to each individual country. It depends a little on how it's going. But, but it's beginning to your point there on, on human uh, rights. I think it's beginning to be recognized in many countries that this is indeed something that we need to do uh, and often needs government support. Uh, from, from an industry point of view, what we can do and, and uh, uh, will be doing is, is, of course, to be able to scale uh, medicines. Uh, I think to your point on, on children here, um, there are beginning to be regulatory uh, opportunities, even though markets might be small, uh, to be able to get uh, a good IP protection, etc. All of those are important elements, I think, of doing what you're doing. But it's encouraging to see the number of countries and large countries that are beginning to go down the road of reasonable health care. Okay. Uh, as she rightly pointed out, this was the is a major concern. In fact, uh, to address this, the country as such had, uh, uh, under the leadership of uh, the Honorable Prime Minister, had launched a program by name Aishman Bharat. It's a, a more or less a, a combination of, uh, it's more like an insurance part where uh, the state governments are also involved in settling the claims. Uh, the funds come from central government, but it deals with 1,000 procedures or so. That is not sufficient, it's inadequate. So in the state of Andhra Pradesh, we have widened that scope and uh, we have uh, come up with our own uh, insurance scheme. It's called YSR Arogeshri Scheme. I named it after my father because that's the kind of uh, priority that I give to that scheme. Uh, so I just want uh, it to be remembered and I want to do a good job out of it. So what we have done is we've scaled the number of procedures to 2,446. From 1,000 what the central government supports, we had increased that uh, to 2,446 uh, procedures. 
and practically uh, we have distributed cards to 1.44 crore houses and uh, we've increased the limit for the eligibility of this card to uh, income limit of 5 lakhs per annum so anybody whose income is less than 5 lakhs per annum is eligible for this card and uh, 1.44 crores out of the total households of approximately 1.5 to uh, 1.53 crores cards that we uh, households that we have 1.44 crore cards are covered under this scheme okay. and uh, last three years uh, uh, we've uh, done almost we've helped almost 25 lakh people mm -hmm. uh, uh, get treatment uh, free of cost here we have about 10 minutes. We're going to fly through a few more questions uh, briefly from the audience. The executive director of UNAIDS is in the audience with us, Winnie Bianima. Uh, I think she would like to ask a question if we can get a mic to her uh, at the back there with the black head wrap in the red top. Thank you, Zinga. Thank you, moderator. And thank you, Panu. Mine's not a question, it's a comment. And. Um, Responding to the subject you're talking about, I don't think that we're going to be on track to resolve a health crisis that turned into an economic crisis without tackling the inequalities that drive them. We are not health security strategies that neglect some people and protect a few privileged, won't protect anyone ultimately. What do we need? We need debt cancellation and we need to drive special drawing rights of the IMF towards developing countries so that they can have the resources to invest in health, in education, to end pandemics, COVID and other pandemics. We need, um, oh, let me put it this way, debt, debt repayments for the low-income countries in the middle of this crisis where several times over they are spent on health, nine times for Africa, nine times more to debt repayments than to investing in health. This can't be a solution. So we do need to get rules of finance, rules of trade, and rules of tax, global rules, to work for developing countries if we are going to come out of a health crisis and an economic crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. I saw there was a hand here, and then there was also a, a hand there. So if we can get mics to both of the participants so we can do rapid-fire questions. Uh, we have about six minutes left for questions from the audience. Thank you very much. My name is Sheila Patel. I represent Shack Dwellers International, which works with urban slum dwellers in 33 countries. I want to give you a message from poor women in urban areas, but I have many friends in rural areas too. We know that real health delivery, sir, is at subnational level. And I want to know whether all of you see value in uh, leapfrogging into involving your populations in promotive health. You know, it's taken us so long to acknowledge that preventive health is important. But in today's world, where along with pandemics and debt and disease, we're also dealing with climate change. And as many people, as uh, you said, said, were affected by famines, are being affected with poisonous fast food mm. and are, are facing chronic diseases at a level with which people in India and China, we know with studies, there's a huge volume of people at very young ages getting chronic diseases like diabetes, blood pressure, and even ch children diabetes because they're eating white carbohydrates and fried food which are poisonous. Thank you. So I'm saying it's much larger than just doing specific things. And economics of that have to come into the discussion about insurance because curative insurance is not enough. Catherine, would you like to respond to that, or was it anyone in, in the panel who would like to respond to that? Well, the only point I would make about that is that I think I agree and 
with everyone here who talks about the importance of primary health care, and I think it's really important, but I do think that nutrition is another critical piece of this. And what we see in so many parts of the world is that children don't get proper nutrition and end up stunted. And once a child is stunted, they can never catch up, ever. So that investment early is so important on the nutrition side. And I, I think to your point, you just have to make sure that children have the nutrients they need so that they grow properly, their brains grow properly. Uh, and if, if not, I think we, we just deal with a lifetime of problems. Okay. Um, if we can have a mic on this part of the room, uh, two, two questions here, and then maybe we're going to be able to take the last question there. All right. Hi, um, I'm Trip Lerpel. I am a primary care doctor and trustee of the John A. Hartford Foundation. Um, and we've talked a lot about children, but I was just wondering if you could speak to the elderly population, um, which was severely affected during the pandemic and will be a future problem for both developing and, and developed countries. Is there a specific person that you'd like to answer that question? Um, or it's open to the floor? Yeah, just if, if someone could comment on um, the aging population in terms of prevention. All right. I, I, I'd be happy to have shots at that. I, I, first of all, I think when the pandemic, those, uh, the elderly were clearly the... Uh, um, the population at, uh, in danger, and, and I think that that was handled well in many countries, less well in other countries, um, where the vaccination rate did not go up high enough into the elderly population, and thereby also protecting them, but also protecting the rest of the rest of the world. Those are things that I think we need to work out with for, for the next time and, and see how we can do that better. Otherwise, the elderly population, you know, are the people who really uh, cost a lot in the, uh, in the healthcare systems. Um, and and if, you, if you look at w how much of healthcare we need when we are older compared to when we are younger, uh, then that's, that's clearly something that needs to be looked at. Early detection, screening efforts, all of those things actually, I think, can catch uh, disease uh, very early. And let me finally make a point on this balance between curative and, and, uh, and preventive. We are trying to spend 97% of all healthcare spending in curative mode and only 3% in prevention. Let me say that again. I think that's absolutely wrong. We seem to all agree on that, and every panel I go to, we agree on that. And then we go home and do nothing. Mm. So I, I think we really would want, as an outcome of this panel, to do something real there. Okay. Last, second last question from Hannah's penultimate question. Um, hi, my name is Silvana Sinha. I'm the founder of Brava Health in Bangladesh, which is a technology peer, uh, pioneer here at the World Economic Forum. Um, our company offers integrated outpatient care. We're a private healthcare provider. So my question is about the role of the private sector and how we create more incentives for investment in, in the things that we're all saying that we need, including primary care and quality diagnostic testing. Um, my company has raised $12 million to get to the point that we've served 360,000 patients, but we have no, no institutional funding because there are no institutional investors that are investing in my sector. Okay. I'd like to take that. <laughs> so um, at the moment, the, the, the primary incentive that, uh, that private sector responds to and challenge me, please, um, is, is really the availability of financing um, and, um, and, and de-risking uh, some of the activities that, that they would be active in. And this goes for not only the pharmaceutical industry, but uh, also private sector that, 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 that runs um, uh, clinics and things around the world. Um, and I think we need to definitely change that to uh, make sure that companies uh, and private sector also recognize that there is a societal need and a social license to operate in, in these markets. Uh, and that combination is basically what needs to come in play uh, in order for people to understand it as financial and non-financial incentives that, that need to be uh, put in place. All right, last question from the floor. Last brief question from the floor. We'll make it brief. Thank you, everyone. Very interesting uh, feedback. My name is Andre Guam, a physician, uh, practicing in the U.S., a physician in chief for oncology for a large statewide 